Okay, my name is Dalton, um, and we are in a series called Unstoppable, where we've been journeying through the life of the early church as well as the book of Acts, and it's been a phenomenal series. It's been exciting. Um, the stories in it are, are incredible, and I hope you've been blessed. I hope that if you've uh, been here the last few weeks, that God has been doing a work in you, uh, speaking to you. Um, yeah, and uh, so let's get right into it this morning. As we begin, I wanted to talk a little bit today about adjectives. Now, I recognize that for many of us, English lessons were quite a many years ago, and perhaps you're the kind of person that, for the life of you, you cannot figure out the difference between adjective, verb, pronoun, vegetable. It's fine, right? So, quick definition to get us started. An adjective is basically a word that describes the qualities or attributes or characteristics about something else. So, an example of an adjective would be sweet, uh, shiny, fast, etc. Right? And I specifically want to talk about the adjectives that we use to describe God. We use many kinds of adjectives to describe God and the kind of attributes that God has. And I think that there are some adjectives about God that we like and some that we don't quite like. Let me illustrate. Here's one that, that we really enjoy. We like to say God is loving. Now, in essence, God is love, like he is the essence of love, but we were not going to get into that today. Just for the sake of argument, God is also loving. Um, and, and we like that because, you know, especially when we are down and out, when we are in need of acceptance, when we don't feel that we are getting the love from our human relationships, it is comforting indeed to know that we have a God who is loving, right? Here's another example. We, we like God is powerful. God is all powerful. Especially if you're caught in a situation right now, or you just come out of a situation where you need a miracle to happen, or where you felt like you were faced with insurmountable uh, odds, or uh, someone close to you, right? Or, or, and, and if he made a way happen, if he, if he made a way where there was no way, you know, it's, it shows up in, in all the songs that we sing, right? Um, we like the adjective that God is powerful, right? Here's another one. We like the fact that God is unchanging. We, we sing it in our songs all the time, right? Same today, yesterday, and forever. One of my favorite hymn lyrics is the line that goes, there is no shadow of turning with thee. I like that line so much because it shows that there is no ounce of difference. He's not volatile. He isn't, you know, sort of, uh, for example, loving one day and then not loving the next. This gives me comfort because as a father, I have my good days and I have my bad days, right? There are some days where my patience is, is high as the heavens above, and there's some days where my patience is like razor thin, and toddlers know how to get into that crack and just pry it right open, right? So, so for me, I'm glad that I do not serve a heavenly father that's like that, yeah? But there's some adjectives about God that I think we don't quite like, we don't quite enjoy. For example, God is just. Now, we like this if the justice is not aimed in our direction, Right? So if, if your spouse has been unkind to you, or if the, have you seen what the people uh, uh, across the road did to you, or your friends, or whatever, oh, then the swift hand of justice be upon them. But when we are the ones toward the, ju- where the justice, then we, okay, God, God will make a way, you know, that kind of thing, right? We, we don't want to think about it, right? Another example of an adjective that we might not like is that God is omnipresent. He, he is everywhere. He, and the reason why we don't like this is because the realization that God is everywhere means God is also right next to you while you are sinning your brains out. He is right next to you while you were unnecessarily unkind to your coworker. He is right next to you when you told that white lie because you wanted to look a certain way or get something that you want and you thought no one was going to get hurt. He was right there. He wasn't asleep. He was right there looking at you. I hope that makes us uncomfortable. But that, that's why that's an adjective we don't necessarily like. Yeah? So there are all kinds of adjectives about God. But I think that hands down, hands down, there is one adjective that is the most challenging to deal with, at least in my, in my opinion. And I have found this one adjective about God is the hardest to deal with. And we're going to take a look at that this morning. Because there's a story in the book of Acts where Paul and his team have a very peculiar encounter with God. And from that story, we see this adjective play out in Technicolor. And I want, to, I want to see how they respond. And from there, we're going to get a sense of why it's so challenging and perhaps how we might be able to deal with it. So before we get into uh, the text, let me just open us up the rest of this time in a word of prayer. Let's pray. God, I thank you for bringing us here. I thank you for the privilege of being able to uh, come before you, listen to your word, um, and receive something fresh, something personal directly from you. I pray that you... Um, you remind us and teach us how to have our hearts be fertile soil for you to sow seeds. And I pray that you open our eyes and our ears and our spirit uh, to receive directly from you. Um, and I commit the rest of uh, the sermon and the service to you. 
In Jesus' name, I pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. So I said, I said there was a group of uh, Jesus followers, Paul and his team, and we're going to see how they deal with it. So I mentioned that this series, we're looking at the book of uh, Acts. And uh, where we are in the story is that Paul and his team are sort of on their way in their church planting journey. So they're going from city to city, country to country, and something's about to happen, and it's going to be quite interesting. So uh, I'm going to walk you through these verses, starting from verse 6 in Acts chapter 16. So the story tells us, they, Paul and his team, went through the region of Phrygia, Phrygia, I don't know how to pronounce it, Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, Mysia, I don't know, not Malaysia, Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, by the way, any of us travel to these places recently, right? No, of course not, right? Because COVID, maybe next year. Yeah? So, but passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, okay? Uh, and then when they get to Troas, Paul, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Now, the scholars tell us that it, this happened while Paul was awake. Otherwise, they would have called it a dream. So he's receiving a vision, and he's awake. Now, I grew up in an environment where vision interpretation was a huge sort of thing, you know, and and, and I've been the beneficiary of people releasing visions and so forth. And the one thing about visions that has always, you know, been, been frustrating is if only visions could just be super clear, like go there, do this, take this job, you know, go to this address, knock on the door, there is a girl, she is to be your spouse, take her home with you, right? You might have to make a police statement along the way, but the point is, this is the girl, right? If only visions were that clear. Unfortunately, in my experience, it is not like that. Unfortunately, it's like, I have a vision for you. You're in the desert, and you're holding a watermelon, and you're singing a song, and I'm like, praise God. I mean, what, what do I do with that, you know? So, so now Paul's about to have a vision, Let's all, even those online, use our collective interpretative skills to see whether we can figure out what this vision means. Right, so a, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And in the vision, a man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. I mean, if you were a seminary professor or a deep theologian, you might guess that the meaning of this is that they're supposed to go over to Macedonia and help them, right? Wouldn't that be great if all our visions were just like that? It, but instead, it's not. Anyway, so, so he has a vision, come over to Macedonia, and so off they go. Uh, and, and Paul and his team said, when we had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called to preach the gospel to them. That's it, just these five verses, right? I want to spend some time in these five verses, and I want to circle back to the beginning, because something interesting is happening here. So in the, at the start of this story, um, the text tells us that they went uh, through somewhere, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now, that word forbidden in the text is actually very strong. It's a very strong word about, you know, really hard kind of restraint. In fact, the root word behind that word is the word punish. So it was a very aggressive sort of language. Compared to the next verse, where the text tells us that the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them, that word is a lot weaker. So even in the two kinds of directives, there is a certain difference in, the, in, in what God was saying. It was essentially the difference between do not go there and you really, really absolutely should not go there kind of a thing, right? The other observation that I made is, in one instance, they, they kind of diverted themselves because they were forbidden. But in the other instance, they actually attempted to go. Now, the text does not tell us how far they, they got in terms of their attempt. It could have been as far as bags are packed, they say their goodbyes, everyone hugging each other, and then they, they literally go. And right before the foot steps across the border, God says, no, turn it around. Right? So in one case, they, they're forbidden and they don't even bother. In the other case, they sort of attempt and then they had to U-turn. Now, the, the, the first observation that I make about the way God functions in this story is that we don't know when he's going to decide to reveal important information to us or important direction. We don't know when. It, we don't know how far we have to progress before he sort of says something that's critical for our journey. We don't know when he's going to reveal that. That's the first thing. The, the next thing is you, we obviously have that vision that I was describing earlier, right? Um, in, the, in the text about, you know, they were forbidden, Jesus' didn't, uh, spirit did not allow them, whatever, we do not know um, whether it was also another vision, whether it was just a, a sense, whether it was a voice, whether someone sort of came and, and, and advised them. We, we do not know. But that tells me also that the second, that's the second observation. The first observation is we don't know when God is going to reveal information. The second is we don't know how. We don't know what mode of communication he's going to use. We don't know what approach he's going to take in, in giving that information to us. 
That's the second thing. The third thing is this. In the whole bit around they were forbidden, one of my questions is why forbidden to speak the word in Asia? Why? I mean, Asian lives matter, right? Obviously, this is not the same Asia as we have now. But the point is, would the people in Asia have benefited from the gospel? Yes. Would, would, would there have been people in need of what Paul and his team were bringing? Yes. Would it have furthered the mission to take the gospel to the ends of the earth if they had gone? Yes. So why did God forbid them, or why did God not allow them to go here and there? And the truth is, we will not know. Maybe it's timing, maybe it's God has his own prioritization, maybe Paul was not ready, maybe they were not ready, we do not know. And that brings me to my third observation from this text. I said we don't know when God is going to reveal information. We don't know how he's going to reveal that information to us. And the third thing is we don't know what among the good options that we have God wants us to choose. Because all of these options are good. They could have gone to any of these countries, right? And you know as well as I do that you do not need divine guidance to decide between clearly good and clearly bad options. We don't, right? No one ever, well... You shouldn't ever sit there and think, I need to seek the Lord about whether I should forgive someone. No, you, you, the Bible says to forgive. That, that it is hard for you to forgive is your problem. But you don't need divine guidance. We're supposed to forgive, right? Where we need divine guidance is to decide between all options that seem good, just like what Paul and his team were doing. So number one, we don't know when God is going to reveal information. Number two, we don't know how. And number three, we don't know what among the good options that we have on the table God wants us to, to choose. Now at this point, I could continue the sermon by telling you about how all of this was for a grander plan, but I won't. I could go on and tell you that, you know, actually the, the diversions that Paul and his team made, they were able to take the gospel to much further than they thought they, they were going um, and, and spread the gospel wider, but I won't. I, I could tell you that because of the eventual journey they took, we have letters to some of these key churches like Corinth and Philippi and Thessalonica, from which we get the books of you know, Corinthians, Philippians, and Thessalonica. But I won't, because that's not the focus today. When I was studying for this sermon, I really sensed that that was not the focus for, for today. The, and the focus, I think, is, is this. Earlier, I said there's this one adjective about God that I think is the hardest to deal with, hands down, at, at least in my experience. And that is this that God can sometimes be so unpredictable. He can be so unpredictable. And in fact, I think that if we had predictable as a modifier for God's other attributes, some of us might feel like that would be quite nice. God, if only you were predictably powerful. Like if I could just take God and like zap, you know, zap my problems, zap my boss, that would be nice, right? Now, first of all, it will not. I would not like to live in a world like that. But, but sometimes we feel like, God, if only you could be predictably answering my questions, right? But, but that's not the reality. The reality is that God can be so unpredictable. And you don't need to hear any more of, oh, it's going to be okay. Oh, you know, brother, I'm praying for you. Oh, I know the plans I have for you, you know, prosper and hope and the future. You don't, you, you've heard enough of that. Maybe you came this morning, maybe I came this morning just to say to somebody, that God is unpredictable. And we serve a God that is unpredictable. But I came also to say this, that even though I don't know how your season is going to change, I, I don't know the answers to your questions, I don't know what God wants to do, and even though God is unpredictable, and even though we might not know the when, or the how, or the what, I know that the who is unchanging. Because I came this morning also to say to somebody, that we serve an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God who wants nothing but the best for you. And maybe the, all he wants to do today is to say that you are right where he wants you to be and that you are doing okay and that he cares for you. Maybe in light of an unpredictable God, that's what I wanted to focus on this morning. But where does, where does that leave us? Because we still have to figure out what to do. Here's one observation that I made from the story of Paul and, and gang that I thought was so key. And it's the observation that they were in constant communication with the Holy Spirit about sort of the next steps. Not the big steps, but the small changes in direction, the sort of the micro direction, if you will. Right? That was the only way. That was the only way they were able to say, we're going to go here because we were forbidden from going to that city. And then we sort of attempted to go there, but then God said no. And then there's a vision, and then off we went. That was the only way. They did not sail halfway across the ocean to preach the gospel and then figure out, God, are we in the right place or not? 
But so often times we do that with our lives, right? We make huge decisions, purchase decisions, marital decisions, career decisions. We never ask God what he thinks. We never ask for his opinion. And then we run in trouble. And then we say, God, where are you? And God would say, I've been here all this while. I haven't moved a muscle, you know? But it's, it was the micro changes in direction that was the key. In fact, I, I, might, I might say it this way. They focus on the steps of micro obedience. Because it is the cumulative steps of micro-obedience that will take us to the macro-shifts in our destiny. But we don't talk about that enough. We like to talk about the big things, the big movements, right? We don't talk enough about the steps of micro-obedience that have to happen before we get there, right? We like to talk about uh, uh, Peter and the haul of fish and the nets were breaking and then eventually he followed Jesus. But we don't talk about the fact that the very first thing Jesus asked of Peter, can I borrow your boat? Micro-obedience. Peter, would you let your boat a little bit out from the shore? Micro-obedience. Peter, would you let your boat a little bit further out from the shore? Micro-obedience. Peter, would you let down your nets? And it was all those things that eventually led to that big moment that we all talk about. But we don't talk about that enough. We, we like to talk a lot about David and Goliath and the five stones and all oh, this battle was won, but we forget that David was first diligently tending sheep every single day. He was just being the errand boy. He was just always dismissed as a younger brother. In fact, he, he, his father, his own father, didn't even, he did not even rise to the dignity of his own father saying, these are all my sons, when, when, when being chosen for king. We don't talk about that, but he was just being obedient day by day. We, we like to talk about Joseph becoming second in command to, to Pharaoh and being able to manage all the resources of Egypt, but we forget that he was first excellent at his work as a slave. And then he, he did the right thing by by refusing the advances of his master's wife and getting thrown into prison for doing the right thing. And in prison, he applied his management skills to, to running the prison. And he applied his dream interpretation for a fellow prisoner. All steps of micro-obedience, but we don't talk about that enough. We like to talk about the big shifts. But I came today to say maybe it is the steps of micro-obedience that will eventually get us to the macro thing. So if I were to leave you with one question this morning, just one, it would be this. What is your next step of micro-obedience? Not the big things, just that one next step. And for some of us here or tuning in online, I'm, I know that as soon as I've asked this question, you know what it is. God's already bringing something to mind. I would pay attention to that. I would suggest that you not forget what was just revealed. As we come to a close, I, I want to share a bit of a story. Last week, I, I uh, in... in um, the sermon I, I shared that I was going through a, a major shift in my career and that it was coming off the back of, you know, a, a bit of a struggle in my job. I want to share a little bit about that struggle. This was sort of in 2018, so not even that long ago, although it feels like a lifetime. Um, I said that I was, I was stuck in a job that I felt I wasn't learning anything, that I felt was really a dead-end job, meaningless, you know, kind of. Um, in, in addition to that, I was struggling with the relationship that I had with my ex-boss. Um, and so many times I woke up and I said, God, I want to quit, I want to leave. You say the word and I will drop that letter of resignation so fast. But he said, no, I want you to stay. And I want you to stay and I want you to love your boss. And I was like, nope, try again. I just, my connection is a bit off. I, I, thought, I thought I heard you say I want you to love your boss. And God said, yeah, that's what I said. And so stay, I did. And I, I wouldn't say that I was perfect in, you know, loving my boss, although I, I, the, the next step of micro-obedience was clear. A couple of months later, my boss's boss's boss approaches me and says that they've handpicked me to join a team in London for a short-term sort of assignment where we were going to be based in a very prestigious uh, consulting firm's office to work on, a, on an exciting project about growing new businesses. Um, it will be an all-expenses-paid sort of trip, and, and it's, I mean, it's London, right? it's hardly a hardship country. Um, and I, my initial thought was I, I actually didn't want to go because at the time, my wife Rachel was pregnant with our first daughter, Brooke, and I'm not going to leave my pregnant wife here while I'm dining on company budget. But she was the one who said, no, you should go. You will be a fool not to take this assignment. It's up your alley. It's what you've always wanted, and, and it is a fast track in your career. And so struggle, struggle, struggle. I prayed about it, or whatever, and I thought that you know, eventually I decided that the, the, the step of micro-obedience for me was to take that assignment, and so I went. 
right? And my wife only had one, she had only one sort of requirement, she said, please come back before I deliver. And of, of course I wanted to, right? Um, and in fact, th when, I, when I landed in Singapore uh, from that assignment, it was literally the beginning of week 36 of her pregnancy, which if you know, means that she can give birth at any time. Um, and so I went, it was a great time. Um, I, I had renewed hope, renewed vigor, renewed expectation about the company. I was, I was hoping that it would generate more opportunities, move to a different role, you know, anything, anything. Watching wallpaper dry was more exciting than my current job at the time, so anything would have been a, a welcome change. Um, and when I came back, bit by bit, aspects of the project were getting torn down. Internal politics, management can't agree, lack of funding, blah, blah, blah. The whole thing was shelved. The whole thing was canned. It was as if the three months had never happened. We spent all that money, all that resource, everything, and it was like, it just did. And I was right back in the same dead-end job that I was doing before. And the difficulty about that is, once you felt how nice the mountain is, suddenly the valley, I didn't realize the valley was that bad, you know? It, but when you've gone up, then it's like, wow, it really feels quite bad. Add to that the fact that my life had taken on a new sense of meaning because I, I had just become a father. And now that, that was contrasted against the lack of meaning in my job. So I, it was really hard to go to work every single day. And that was also the time when my relationship with my, my ex-boss started to worsen and things started to escalate. And I shared this in a story, uh, in a sermon that I gave last year, where I felt that at that time, my step of micro-obedience was to apologize to her. Struggle, struggle, struggle. Eventually, I did. About a week later, um, news came that they were moving my ex-boss to a different division. So new boss comes in. Uh, still same dead-end job, just new boss. A few months later, new boss says, uh, someone's leaving in another position that we, that we have and I want to prime you for that position. And it was going to be a huge pay jump. It was going to be um, moving from being an individual contributor to being a team leader. And for me to do the job well, they would have to send my entire family on an expatriate package to Shanghai. Again, not a hardship country. And so we were quite excited. We were like, yeah, you know, how can we make this happen? Um, and my boss said, you know, just, just focus on these things. And in addition to that, I want you to take on a whole new portfolio of work so that we can demonstrate that you know, we're already stretching you and that you're, you're taking more responsibility to kind of increase the justification for, for, for moving you there. And so I said, yeah, you know, let, let's do it. Long story short, I didn't get the job. I mean, obviously I'm here, but I, I, I didn't get the job. I went to someone else. And until today, I don't understand what happened. You know, I, I obviously went to my boss and I said, did I misunderstand? Did I, I mean, like, I, I pulled out, I said, what, what, what happened to all the, the, the meetings, the notes that I took, the conversations we had? You know, the, the, the messages that we had, the days we had, the songs we sang together. No, I mean, the, but, but I was like, I, I didn't say that, but, but, but I was like, like did, I, did I see it wrongly? Or, until today, I don't have an explanation. I don't know whether she was covering something up, whether she was backpedaling, I do not know. Point is, I didn't get the job, it went to someone else, and I had to find out when the, per when the person's like, job announcement came out. I was like, oh, I thought that was my job. Um, it was very painful at the time. Obviously, God in his infinite wisdom knew that if I had gone, COVID would have struck, and in a few months, our whole family would have had to move back. But at the time, I didn't know. So then, I was stuck back in my dead-end job with a new portfolio of work that I had agreed to take on, with no light at the end of the tunnel, and no extra pay. Praise be to God, right? So I, I was there, and I was doing this. <laughs> few, few months later, um, a super exciting opportunity comes up in, in the company, a different division, entirely different job. Um, this role would be second to the chief technology officer in one of the divisions to help them grow you know, new businesses, very much in line with what I, I, I enjoy, very much in line with what I was doing in London. I said, I, I want this job. You know, I, I, I spoke to my boss, I said, we've had a rough few years. Obviously, there's no progression by way of that, that Shanghai job anymore. Um, can I apply for an internal transfer? Boss said yes, spoke to the, the person, sent in my resume, I interviewed for the job, and I got selected as a, as a top candidate. And then the whole company goes on a hiring freeze thanks to COVID. So the, the, the new manager says, yeah, we like you, we want you for the job. We do not know when this hiring freeze is going to complete. And we do not know if the hiring freeze is over, whether the job will still exist. So have fun in your, in your limbo, you know? And at this point, my emotional journey is like, woo! It's like, you know, you, you have expectation and then you're pulled back. You're hopeful and then you're pulled back. You know, you get promised and you're pulled back. And I was, I was just, and I'm still stuck in the same dead-end job that I was doing in the beginning. And 
it was also about that time that the doors began to open and things began to unfold for what I'm eventually doing right now, which, which actually I would consider a, a dream job, something that I, 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 I didn't expect, but, but really it, it feels like it's the dream, which I won't go into today, one, because we have no time, and two, because that's not the focus of this story. Um, and that dead-end job that I was talking about right now actually feels like it's very much welcome and part of the grander plan that, that I was not seeing. And I'm very thankful for that dead-end job, actually. I'm still doing that job. Um, but that's not the focus of this story. The focus of this story was, I, I've, I've lived long enough to know that if I just focus on this one question, what is my next step of micro-obedience? What is God requiring me of me sort of next? Not, 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 not next year, not 10 years from now, just sort of next. I, I've lived long enough to know that if I focus on that question, eventually I will get led to the macro things. And, and Perhaps, as we bring this to a landing today, we have questions. I'm sure you came with questions. I'm sure you, you spend your, your, your week, your year, asking God for things. And I don't know the answers to that questions. I don't know when things are going to change. I don't know what success is going to look like. I, I don't. But perhaps we're asking the wrong questions. What if God is waiting for us to ask different questions? What if God is waiting to see whether we're faithful with the steps of micro-obedience before he begins to reveal the big things. So, as we, as we head into another week, as we head into another year, I'm sure for 2022, everybody's making big plans, big resolutions, big commitments. Oh, I'm going to be thin next year. I'm going to save all this money. I'm going to stop watching Netflix, whatever your, your, your commitments are. Instead of the big things, perhaps we should ask the small questions. Perhaps the Holy Spirit would say, instead of asking, God, what is my calling in life? What is my calling? What is, what is the, the thing? What is my big thing? Let's ask, of the little gifts and inclinations that you have given me, how can I use that to serve somebody today? How can I use that to serve somebody next week? You know, instead of asking, God, is next year going to be the year where I change my job? Is next year going to be the year where I get a promotion, whatever? Let's just ask, what does excellence require of me in the current task that I have, in the current project? How can I serve my, my boss? How can I serve my customers, my vendors, my partner, my co-workers? What does excellence require of me next week? You know, instead of asking God about the big, you know, how much money are we going to save next year? How much, what, what, what are we going to buy? What are these big purchase decisions? How about we ask how we can be generous in the small things? How can we make, make a difference in somebody's day in the smallest of ways? Instead of asking God, who are you going to bring into my life next year that's going to change everything? Maybe it's a, it's a new friend, maybe it's a, it's a business partner, maybe it's a, it's a spouse, whatever. Who are the people that are in our lives today that God wants us to sow into? What are the friendships that we have right now that God wants us to make a difference in? Because I think that if we focus on this one question, what is your next step of micro-obedience? We're eventually going to see big things happen, even though I don't know how your story is going to end. And I think that, that in light of the unpredictable God that we serve. I think this should be the focus for us. And I'm confident of one thing, and that is that if we focus on this one question, that is how individually, as couples, as families, and as a body of Christ, we will truly be unstoppable. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for the opportunities that you've given us, the abundance that you've given us. And Lord, we want to, we want to repent of the ingratitude that we've shown. We want to in repent of the times where we complained. We want to repent of the times that we forgot to see things as you would see them. and of the times where we thought we knew better. So God, as your people come to you and ask this question, what is our next step? What does that micro-obedience look like for us? God, I just pray that you would reveal that so clearly to someone this, this morning whether online, wherever around the world they're from, or someone here this morning. God, I pray that you would just lodge something so deep in their heart and their mind 
that they know it's from you. God, I just pray that you start to bring to light conversations that need to be had, relationships that need to be mended, things that need to be cut off, things that need to be stopped. And I just pray that you cover us with your love and your grace because we won't always get it right. But that we look to you anyway and we say, God, help us. Reveal to us what it is that we're supposed to do. God, I pray that you give somebody just a double portion of your anointing and your, and your courage and that boldness to step forward into the unknown, maybe, into risk. Knowing that we will always be better off taking risks where you have called us than trying to do something safe on our own. God, I just pray a huge blessing over everyone who's here and who's tuning in online. I pray for a great week ahead. I pray for a great year ahead. And I just commit all these people to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.